Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this APPG on Migration uh, event for Refugee Week. Uh, my name's Paul. I'm uh, Paul Butler. I'm the Bishop of Durham, uh, and it's my privilege to be uh, one of the co-chairs of the APPG. Um, we're thinking today about a displaced talent visa, a complementary pathway for refugee resettlement in the U new UK immigration system. Uh, by way of introduction, I want to emphasise that uh, in discussing ways of bringing additional refugees to the UK and ensuring they are adequately cared for. So we're, we're looking at this in terms of additionality. Uh, there's a large number of people on the call. Uh, we've already got 74. We're expecting a few more than that. Um, we are keen to highlight uh, the, the, the fact that there's a very wide range of people uh, on the call who will hold a range of opinions about uh, complementary pathways. Um, uh, and we, we hope to be able to hear from uh, a, a number when it comes to the questions. Um, we have people at, from other parts of the world joining us on the call as well. One of the advantages of Zoom. Uh, the emphasis is to gather perspectives and explore what shared interest there might be in thinking creatively about safe and legal routes to refugees. We all know that humanitarian refugee resettlement is the cornerstone of our commitment to providing a safe refuge for people who are fleeing conflict and persecution. And we all look forward to the official launch of the government's new resettlement scheme. And we want to see that succeed. Uh, personally, I've been involved heavily with community sponsorship. And one of the things that that has shown is how constructive engagement of business, communities, government and civil society can lead to more refugees being brought into the UK. And, and we were delighted when it was announced last year that community sponsorship would be additional numbers uh, as we go forward now. We want to think about what other opportunities might arise from the development of the new immigration system to create additional safe legal routes for refugees. And we're going to be to hear about one specific proposal, which is about using the labour market mobility, a dedicated displaced talent visa, which Talent Beyond Boundaries has been developing. Uh, and our first speaker, Marina Brizard, will introduce that in a few moments. We're delighted that amongst us, uh, we have a large number of businesses represent, who, who, present, including IRES, who have brought someone to the UK on a two, tier two visa as a pilot. We have people from uh, Australia and Canada, possibly other countries as well. Thank you for joining us. We've got legal and policy experts too. Gemma Hislop from Fragerman is on hand. If you come up with any technical questions that none of the rest of us can answer. We have lots of friends from organizations in the sector and we look forward to hearing their perspectives. We're delighted that Stephen is with us from Refugee Action and Sasha from UNHCR. And we're going to hear from each of our speakers, then there'll be a chance for Q&A. Uh, the way we're going to do the Q&A is please put your questions in the chat box at the bottom at any time you like, but we'll, we'll save those up and then we'll call on you during the discussion to ask them. If you don't want to ask your question yourself because the event is being recorded, and I need to be, you need to know that the event is being recorded, please write a non after your question uh, and we will uh, therefore not uh, reveal your name. So my huge thanks to uh, those who've done all the hard graft of organizing, to Vinya and Heather and others, uh, but particular thanks to Marina, Stephen and Sasha. Um, and uh, uh, we're gonna begin by hearing from Marina. Marina is UK Director of Talent Beyond Boundaries. Their focus is on pioneering labor mobility as a complementary solution to traditional humanitarian refugee resettlement. And prior to joining TBB, Marina was an immigration lawyer. And in 2018, her re Marina's research during a Churchill Fellowship on labour mobility as a complementary pathway informed the development in Australia of the framework for a bespoke hybrid displaced talent visa for skilled forcibly displaced people. Marina was born herself in Bosnia, but spent much of her childhood in a refugee camp in Croatia, before being resettled to Australia. She has various legal accolades, and in 2015, she was Young Migration Lawyer of the Year, uh, according to the Law Council of Australia, uh, and in 2016, Woman Lawyer of the Year. She's now moved to London, 
and uh, to head up TBB here in London. Marina, it's a delight to have you. Over to you. Thank you very much. And I might say I moved to London a week before lockdown. So my experience has been quite unique, but I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you to the APPG, to Bishop uh, Butler for, for inviting us and allowing us to share our experience and our, our vision um, for a displaced talent visa. So I share my screen now and I hope that you can all see it. Um, Vinya, please let me know if there are any uh, technical difficulties. But I start with this. The theme for this year's Refugee Week is imagine. So I ask you a question. Can you imagine a world where people are able to move for work based on their skill and experience and not necessarily their personal circumstance? It sounds simple enough and for most of us even obvious if we've moved abroad for work. But for forcibly displaced people, which includes refugees and stateless people, international skilled migration is far from simple. So today I'm here to propose Talent Beyond Boundaries Displaced Talent Visa Solution and at the outset emphatically propound that this is not a proposal for a skill-based asylum and resettlement program. Rather, it is a proposal to amend the existing skilled migration program to give equitable access to displaced people. One of the beneficiaries of this solution is Halef, who joins us on the call today. Halef was born and raised in Aleppo, where he completed a Bachelor of Software Engineering at the end of 2013. He was then forced to flee Syria for Lebanon, where he and his family did not hold legal status, did not have the right to work, did not have any support apart from sporadic humanitarian assistance. So he found a way to illegally and remotely work as a software engineer to make ends meet, but also to keep his skills relevant. Halif engaged with TBB in 2019 and was identified as a strong candidate for a software engineer position at IRIS, which is a multinational financial technology company. He went through a competitive recruitment process, did a coding test in which he scored a distinction and was extended an employment offer. According to Halif, the day I learned that I got an offer, it's like someone is in a deep well and you throw a rope for him. Getting the job was one thing, then came the challenge of securing the visa. And that's what we're talking about here today. With the help of immigration lawyers at BWB, Halif was navigated through the immigration rules and granted a T2 visa. He migrated with his wife and two daughters to Cheltenham in August last year. And since then they've been flourishing. The man that you see here in the black shirt is the CEO of IRIS, Andrew Walsh. He's been interested in and personally involved with our displaced talent visa model and advocacy in both Australia and the UK. This week he published a blog in which he said, it strikes me as both unfair and inefficient that we're unable to match up talented refugees with companies desperate for skilled employees. And was proud of the pioneering role Iris has played in proving that both displaced talent mobility can happen, but when it does, there are significant positive impacts for the econ economy and society at large. He has made a commitment to building recruitment pipelines that are inclusive of displaced talent visa, despite the fact that there's been a rise in virtual working. In his view, video technology doesn't help talented refugees who remain displaced. So here are three things that we've learnt in our pilots in Australia and Canada. The first is there are many thousands of skilled refugees living in displacement. In our field offices in Lebanon and Jordan, TBB manages a talent catalogue of over 18,000 candidates who represent over 150 occupations, including in healthcare, technology, engineering, professional services and hospitality. Second, we know that employers in the UK hire employees to fill specific positions on the basis of merit through a competitive recruitment process. For those employers we have spoken to in the UK, the preference has overwhelmingly been to hire locally. However, there are openings for international sponsorship as it is often required for the right candidate. Finally, we are aware that the UK is facing skill shortages now exacerbated by the pandemic which cannot be filled by the local labour market. 
For example, according to research done by the Nuffield Trust last year, the NHS in England is facing around 100,000 vacancies for permanent posts in trusts alone. Challenges also exist in Northern Ireland and in Wales. Meanwhile, TBB have a thousand healthcare workers ready, willing and able to work in the UK to ease this skill shortage. Our experience teaches us that with international employment and visa options, it's possible for more people like Halif to get out of displacement through safe, legal and regular visa pathways such as the T2. However, as you'll see in this infographic, there are obstacles preventing the scaling of this solution to the benefit of all involved. Barriers are administrative, policy and financial. And the fact is that these barriers can be overcome. Doing so would normalise this complementary pathway out of displacement without compromising the integrity of the skilled migration program, nor diluting the protection and resettlement program. So the displaced talent visa to us is a win-win-win solution and we've proven that in Australia and Canada. But this displaced talent visa stream is one which the UK can pioneer. Together with our technical immigration and advocacy partners at Fragament, we propose the introduction of a displaced talent stream of the T2 skilled visa. The key features which are guiding our design are taken largely from the UNHCR's guidelines and complementary pathway. The first being additionality and complementarity. This is the cornerstone feature of any proposal we make and requires that the sanctity of the resettlement and protection programs is preserved so that these programs continue to focus and assist vulnerable refugees without introducing human capital or skill criteria. The second feature is protection against reform want, discrimination and exploitation. This involves ensuring access to legal documentation, essential services in the UK upon arrival, and ultimately a durable solution. This is where we see a partnership with Refugee Action and Reset and other organisations as vitally important. Autonomy and empowerment is an important feature which puts displaced people in charge of decisions about where they want to live and the option to seek visas based on secured employment opportunities. Connected to this is equitable access, whereby forcibly displaced people are able to compete on a level playing field with applicants who are not living in displacement, like myself, an Australian going for a T2 visa. Our employer-led approach acknowledges that employers are the best judge of suitability for employment, so should determine and drive recruitment selection processes leading to visa suitability. In doing so, we bring the private sector into this as a key stakeholder in the complementary pathway. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, is the fact that this solution is refugee-centred in design, in monitoring and evaluation to ensure that the accessibility and positive impact we are striving to achieve is actually achieved. TBB acknowledge that there are skilled people in the UK who are unemployed, underemployed, seeking asylum or members of other disadvantaged groups. Vying for recruitment and employment opportunities is difficult. But to be clear, this is not a one size fits all solution and is but one of a myriad of solutions to solve a myriad of global issues. I reiterate also you know, that we are not seeking to create competition nor to conflate resettlement and complementary pathways. We are just that, a complementary additional pathway. We seek to increase employer visibility to and equitable access for displaced people to travel for work, to be considered for work, Instead of reducing them to the choice of either embarking on a dangerous, irregular passage to seek asylum, to opt for resettlement where vulnerability is assessed, or living in displacement without status, work rights or opportunity, and suffering extreme forms of discrimination and racism. Our experience in Australia is indeed that by working with employers to secure employment and solutions for, pe for displaced people abroad, We've also built capacity and the desire to hire displaced people locally. It's not a zero sum game. So to conclude, I'd like to quote Albert Einstein, who himself was a refugee. He said that imagination is everything. It is the preview of life's coming attractions. 
So I invite you to allow your imagination to take you to a place where forcibly displaced people have options based not on their vulnerability and circumstances of displacement, but on their skills and human attributes of resilience, integrity, loyalty and courage. Thank you. Marina, thank you uh, enormously for that. Uh, and some questions have begun to come in. A reminder, do drop the questions into the chat. We'll be taking those uh, later on. Um, our second speaker, Stephen Hale, is Chief Executive of Refugee Action, which is a national charity that aims to enable all asylum seekers and refugees to access justice and rebuild their lives successfully here in the UK. Uh, prior to this, Stephen worked at Oxfam International, with responsibility for their global campaigns and advocacy. Uh, and pre that, he was director of the Green Alliance, and uh, he was honored for his work there for services to the environment with an OBE. Um, uh, and he, that, previous to that, but forgive him for this, he was a UK government uh, advisor. Um, we've asked Stephen to concentrate on uh, the, the, what protections and support would need to be in place to support displaced individuals and their families. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much for being with us, and we look forward to listening to you. Thank you very much to the invitation and to Marina for, you know, an, an impeccable exposition of the positive case for this, the case that I think it's a, it's a creative idea, it's an interesting new idea, and it adds to the key challenge we face, which is how to create more, more safe and legal routes. But I want to focus on the bigger picture, and I make no apology for that, because the key challenge facing all of us who are concerned about sustaining or enhancing the UK's reputation as a country of welcome for refugees is how we do that in the round and where this idea might sit in the current politics of refugees and asylum in the UK. So that's where I want to focus. I want to ask if bringing this to the table will enhance and expand the number of people who are likely to be able to come to the UK to make safe and legal journeys. That feels to me to be the critical question because everybody on this call, I suspect, knows the global picture. You know, there are over 25 million refugees in the world. Their number is very likely to rise. The global pandemic is creating new and serious challenges, obviously, for those people in many, many countries in the world. And the expansion of safe and legal routes is literally a matter of life and death for people who at present cannot make safe and legal journeys and are forced to make desperate journeys that often are fatal for them. And in the UK, clearly, in family reunion and resettlement, we do have two routes. What I want to focus on is where are we now and what is the outlook for sustaining or expanding those routes and how might that those conversations be affected by bringing this new idea to the table. Because over the past five years, the UK has become one of the global leaders in resettlement through as a result of the creation of the Syrian resettlement program that was alluded to at the outset, with around you know, 6,000 people coming to the UK each year, almost 90% of them Syrians, as people will be aware. It's a program that was highly popular to over 200 local authorities chose to participate in it. But where we are now, today, that scheme has come to an end. And the new scheme has been established, which is due to end, only has a one year life commitment until March 2021. And of course, there are no arrivals at present due to the COVID-19 crisis. And there's no certainty about the future of the scheme. So no local authority in the UK can make a new long term commitment to resettlement. What we also see over the past few months is a very clear agenda of hostility from the current government to people seeking asylum. No new commitments to expand family reunion, very strong language around pushing back people who might be making the desperate journey across the channel, really tough decisions being made around you know, levels of asylum support, which are leaving people at tremendous risk in this crisis, still a right a ban on the right to work for people in the asylum system. Even you know, the idea that, that doctors or nurses who are trapped in the asylum system with no decision made on their case didn't lead to you know, those people being given the right to work in, uh, in March 2020 when the COVID-19 crisis kicked off. So that's where we are. 
And the narrative of this government is very clear that they want to welcome immigrants if and only if they have skills. And so in conclusion, I want to highlight that this is how I see this question. The challenge for us all is to make Britain a nation that is a country of sanctuary, is a country of welcome. And right now, that means defending the principle of asylum, all of us, because it is under attack. And it means making absolutely clear that we need to sustain and expand the existing safe and legal routes, which means a new long-term commitment to the resettlement program, which means facilitating the access of people, whether they're in Calais, whether they're in Greek, Greece, whether they're in Italy, wherever they may, the, they may be in the world, to family reunion. And if we do those things, then the UK will be that, you know, will be facilitating safe and legal routes. And then I can see how this fits into that. But there's also a nightmare scenario that when the government is asked in six months or 12 months, what are you doing to facilitate safe and legal journeys for refugees? They say, well, we've got a great new initiative that we, we took from Australia. And that's my concern. I think this is an excellent proposal. I, I think mm. it was brilliantly uh, laid out by Marina. But I think all of those considering this idea also have to consider whether they will also be speaking up and advocating and securing the expansion of other safe and legal routes. Because if we win this route, but we close down others, then the net effect is more people unable to travel and more people making potentially deadly journeys. So that's how I wanted to, uh, you know, the, the bigger picture that I wanted to outline. Harris, it's and you're quite right to, to say we we have to ensure that all those routes are secured uh, and that we tackle some of those issues around asylum seekers too. Um, our third speaker today is Sasha Ali. Sasha is a resettlement officer for the UNHCR. Uh, she's currently based in London, uh, though she's previously worked in Asia, Africa and the Middle East. She has a medical and a legal background uh, and has extensive experience in refugee protection, refugee status determination, resettlement and child protection. She's also a particular interest in mitigating sexual and gender-based violence and developing the self-reliance of refugees and their meaningful participation in civic life. We've asked Sasha to, to focus on uh, the, her view of, of the considerations in identifying suitable displaced people for a scheme like the one that Marina's outlined and what support they may require. So Sasha, very many thanks for being with us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Bishop Paul. <clears throat> and many thanks uh, for inviting you in at CR. I'm delighted to be here to discuss the proposal outlined by Marina. And uh, uh, thank you, Stephen, for your introduction and reflections as well. Um, it hardly needs repeating, uh, but as the previous speakers have reminded us, refugees bring in valuable skills and experiences to the host communities. One only needs to look at the myriad of positive stories that are being shared and the events this week to understand how refugees enrich the UK society. <clears throat> so complementary pathways, as uh, Marina has also explained, is not at all resettlement, but um, it could include a number of uh, pathways such as labour mobility schemes, education pathways, other humanitarian routes and family reunification. So uh, before I go into the identification phase, uh, I would like to provide some more clarity by answering three broad questions. What are complementary pathways has been mostly covered by Marina, uh, but why is it important for refugees and, 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 and how should these complementary pathways be designed? Um, as already explained, complementary pathways are safe and regulated avenues for refugees. They allow refugees to travel to a third country by providing lawful stay um, and, 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 and some protection um, safeguards put in place. Uh, complementary pathways would often require flexibility in, in these special safeguards. Uh, for example, a government may relax some visa requirements such as having a national passport or a birth certificate to allow a refugee to take up a scholarship in a country uh, abroad. Uh, it's also important to understand that complementary pathways are a different form and additional to refugee resettlement programs. And the more I say, the less it is. So it's not um, 
it's not going to sort of, um, you know, replace a resettlement program, hopefully, but these are complementary pathways. Uh, for, the ref for these refugees who are identified and prioritized uh, by UNHCR, um, protection element remains to be the main element when they are submitted for resettlement. So a person uh, with certain kind of vulnerabilities and protection needs are put forward to a state to accept um, them uh, to be resettled. And very often these people are at risk and their lives depend on being uh, taken out of the country of asylum and brought over to a third country. UNSCR welcomed the UK's government's announcement that will continue resettling people and the new program, the UKRS, was announced. However, with the COVID-19 situation, obviously there have been some delays. However, resettlement is, is only available to a very small percentage of refugees each year. So, you know, less than 1% of almost 26 million refugees are resettled every year. So complementary pathways in a way would be um, another safe route, such as labor mobility. And uh, refugees will be able, not only be able to use their skills, but also access protection where other solutions are limited. Here it's also worth remembering that about 85% of the refugees live in developing regions. Indeed, it was this uh, it was partly this disparity that brought states together to affirm the Global Compact on Refugees in 2018. The compact agreed by 181 state, states called for improved mechanisms for sharing responsibility globally for refugees and recognizes that complementary pathways can facilitate access to protection um, and also provide solutions for refugees. Complementary pathways can also be an expression of solidarity with host countries and um, communities. It's also important to understand that complementary pathways are very different from asylum. They do not substitute the rights owed to the refugees under the Refugee Convention. And don't, for example, affect a refugee's right to be protected, protected against return to their country of origin. Um, effective asylum systems must exist alongside complementary pathways, just as they exist alongside resettlement. So expanding complementary pathways then is about increasing opportunities for refugees, but not at the expense of asylum or resettlement. This brings me to some key considerations and safeguards relevant to the proposal we are discussing today. Um, those I'll discuss are not, not exhaustive. For a more comprehensive list, I would encourage you to look up um, uh, at our key considerations for complementary pathways guidance, which was published last year. First, systems and procedures need to be in place to guarantee refugee protection against uh, um, protection for refugees against being sent back to their country of origin. Refugees should, in principle, also have the right to re-enter the first country of asylum and enjoy the same rights and status that they had prior to departure. It, if refugees cannot return to the first country of asylum or the country of origin, they need to be able to seek asylum or to attain another secure legal status allowing them to remain in the third country after completion of their uh, program or the sort of employment. A second consideration is that refugees benefiting from complementary pathways need to have access to legal status and documentation in the third country. In this respect, flexibility is required due to specific situation of the refugees. For example, a refugee should generally not be required to approach the authorities of the country of origin to obtain a passport, for example, and where applicable refugee convention travel documents or other travel documents should be issued. Um, the final issue I'd like to cover briefly as uh, um, Bishop, you mentioned, is the selection. It is critical that complementary pathways for labor mobility are non-discriminatory and do not distinguish on the basis of nationality, race, gender, religious belief, class, or political opinion. Pathways need to be based on an objective criteria, taking into consideration the specific situation of the refugees' concerns, such as educational learning needs in case of, um, uh, you know, education pathways, but also uh, sort of um, their skills, which match with um, the employment or, or the possibility of getting a job or an offer, but also the medical and psychological needs that uh, result from forced displacement. 
Um, so just to wrap it up, um, we're ready to work collaboratively with refugees, the UK government, NGOs, civil society and private sector to continue this discussion and explore how complementary pathways, such as the one being proposed today, um, can be expanded to provide safe uh, and legal pathways for refugees, but also and crucially that these programs are thoughtfully designed with proper safeguards and, and, and you know, we're able to sort of have a wholesome debate around it. Thank you and I look forward to your questions. But for um, responding to the brief of actually kind of uh, covering different aspects of it and uh, raising some of the questions yourselves about what needs to be covered to ensure that anything like this would work well as, a, as a, an additional complementary pathway. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask, uh, to, I, when I call you, you'll need to unmute or uh, you'll be unmuted. Um, but could you, could you say who you are and uh, if you work for an organization, if you're a business person, just, just say very, very briefly, but just who you are so we know the context from which you're asking the question. Um, the first person I'm going to call is A. Mahmood, uh, who has a question around the Tier 2 visa system. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yep. Uh, well, my name is Abdullah, and I am a asylum seeker in the UK for the past six months. Um, I currently work in the UK. However, um, the question that I was wondering about is um, why don't you suggest a, an ease due to visa route instead of having a separated uh, displaced tenant visa? Um, if, if, if anybody can, can reflect to that, thank you. Thank you. Marina, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I'll try and tackle that. So I'm just looking at your the, the extended version of your question, which says, you know, as far as the scheme is employer led, why not use an existing visa? And the answer is we are using an existing visa. So our proposal is that within the T2 visa, there is a stream which is for displaced talent. And what we're looking at doing there is seeking concessions that align with complementary pathway guidelines to make it more accessible. For example, uh, Sasha helpfully mentioned the issue of a passport. If there is someone in displacement and can't go to their country of origin for a passport, or they are stateless and can't obtain a passport, looking at alternative travel documents as acceptable to establish identity. Other factors, including, um, you know, the manner in way um, that English language tests are provided, the ability to pro provide funds um, and, and settlement funds, which is a requirement of the T2 and how to get around that, is what's in our consideration. So the answer to your question is we are trying to use an existing pathway, but in that existing pathway, introducing concessions. In addition to that, we are hoping to advocate for the broader points test, which is an Australian based points test that I'm very familiar with, to introduce points on the basis of displaced talent so as to equal the level playing field. So we are not trying to create a new visa, we are trying to adapt the existing skilled visa to make it more accessible to both employers but also to people who are seeking um, protection through a complementary pathway. Thank you, Marina. Stephen or Sasha, do you want to add anything? Uh, I think Marina has explained very well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, if I could then uh, call on uh, Sheila Hurd, um, if you'd like to look at the question, uh, Stephen and Sasha and, and Marina, because it's quite long, but uh, Sheila. Right, thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm a careers advisor and uh, I run a social enterprise in London called Transitions and we specifically assist refugee engineers, architects and business services back into employment. Uh, I've been doing this work for a long long time, it's extremely difficult and as I've mentioned on my um, comment slash question, um, there are many 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 refugees of every skill level already in the UK struggling to find employment and I'm really finding it difficult to understand how it can be appropriate. I, I understand the terrible situation that people are in of course, um, but 
how this proposal, which you know I understand is pragmatic and um, cannot be eroding the basic principles of asylum, that asylum is there for safety for everyone who requests it. It's not an easy topic, is it? But that's my question, yeah. Yep, yeah, thank you. Um, rather than go to Marina, but Stephen, do you want to, to comment on that, on Sheila's point? I will do briefly, but I'd also be interested in Marina's reflection yeah. because, um, as you know, my as, as I said, you know, I see I, I can absolutely understand the case for this, but my concern is that we need to see an expansion of safe, safe and legal routes into the UK, and I see those shrinking at present. And if advocates pivot to something which is built entirely around people having a skill as the basis on which they might be able to come into the country, then I think uh, Sheila is right that we, we are conceding an absolutely core core principle. And I'm really, I'm really concerned about that. It feeds a, a, a very strong narrative, which is being run by the present government, that if you want to come to the UK, show us you've got the skills. And we have people who are in the UK who have those skills, who are banned from working. Yeah, so Marina? Quite a loaded topic, um, but I'll do my best to, to respond to it um, in, in a sort of layered approach. The first is to say we're not the silver bullet. So Sheila works at an organisation that does tremendous work. And our proposal is that simply we add to the uh, candidates that she is able to put forward for employment for specific positions. So it is not a matter of having any exclusivity for labour mobility candidates, this is an additionality. And the best example of that is our strongest partner in Australia, which is an organisation called Refugee Talent. So Refugee Talent started as an organisation that helped people seeking asylum in Australia. So people who were already there with work rights trying to find employment. They then added TBB's database to their offering. And when they went to employers, they said, let's find the right person because this is employer led. And if that right person is overseas, we engage in labor mobility. But obviously the preference from the majority of employers is that they don't want to go through the time, expense and effort of um, recruiting someone from overseas and going through the visa process. I mean, that's why I had a job as an immigration lawyer. So that's one aspect. The fact that in um, proposing applications, we do so with a combination of local um, applicants as well as overseas applicants. That's one component. The second is that we are using completely different language to the humanitarian language. We purposely use displaced talent. We are purposely positioning this as a skilled visa. And the ultimate goal is, the comparison here is not asylum seekers or people who are going through the resettlement program. The comparison here are Australians. So a person in Lebanon who is a mathematician but is stateless should have the same access to opportunities as an Australian. That is the point of comparison. And so what our, what our position really is, is that there are organisations who are helping those, no doubt, in dire need already in the UK, who need to be skilled. And, and the, you know, the, um, the work campaign led by Refugee Action is incredibly important, but that's not where we have a value add. What we are trying to do is give employers more options. And the final thing that I'll say on this is that this will be a slow burn. So we don't expect changes to happen within at least two years. In the meantime, we will continue to rely on the tier two general visa to bring people in as we would any other skilled migrant. And with that slow burn, we will ensure in all our advocacy that the two programs run side by side with the knowledge that TBB have a database of candidates that they can caveat and take away from governments if there is any level of propriety in that, you know, a skill-based or a human capital-based criteria is applied to resettlement or protection programs. So we are not attempting to, again, create competition. We are just adding another layer of support to get more people out of displacement because that number is growing. And as Sasha helpfully pointed out, resettlement only accounts for 1% of people who get out of dire situations. So we're just trying to bring more people out of resettlement based on their skill. 
Thank you, Marina. Um, uh, there's uh, Vinya, uh, who's moderating behind the scenes for us. Uh, could you send the question uh, from uh, Jill Rutter to Gemma from Fragoman so that I can call her in uh, after, the, after this next question, which is a fairly quick one, uh, Marina, uh, which is um, alongside Australia and Canada, uh, and now the UK, are, are, is this being looked at in any other countries at the moment? Yeah, so uh, this model, I mean, it, it's a matter of capacity and resources of Talent Beyond Boundaries as an organisation that, I mean, our, our strength comes from the fact that we've trialled this. So from identifying candidates to the you know, identifying candidates to the corporate outreach, the entire recruitment process, the immigration process, resettlement, and everything that comes from that. So we have a, a, quite a specialised knowledge. We are speaking to governments um, in other countries, both as destination countries, but as source countries. So um, our colleagues in Canada are working on a pilot with um, uh, a partner in Kenya to bring uh, skilled nurses into Canada. We are looking at other um, places, including Colombia and Turkey. Um, but in terms of destination countries, the most important thing for TBB is that we um, arrive to the country, we adapt our solution as it is most suitable to that country, we affect the system change, for example, the introduction of this new stream, and then we disappear because we want to graft our solution onto organisations that are already doing ter terrific work. So it's not a matter of TBB becoming a new global superpower. We really are looking at uh, consulting on this as we have been in the UK and handing it over to the trusted established partners in the UK to run. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Zoe Gardner, you, you have a question. This is the one that Gemma from Fragman is going to answer for us. But Zoe, ask your question. Um, thank you, yes. Um, so um, I'm uh, wondering, so if you, you've clarified that you're talking about a sort of extension to the tier two visa system, um, what I don't understand then is that you're talking about bringing refugees into the country uh, on a tier two visa, therefore, they, I assume, would not have refugee status recognised by the state. And doesn't that raise some serious risks around um, the principle of non refoulement if they uh, then happen to lose their job or, you know, in, in any case, uh, we're no longer able to benefit from the tier two protection. And I would also just like to add sort of uh, somewhat in support of what Stephen said earlier, just to question this, this very strong idea that obviously is the only way to sort of um, contemplate this is if, as a complementary um, scheme, but um, it's, 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 it's slightly false to say that it would be fully complementary in any case, because it, it necessarily would take resources to achieve this, it would take resources to implement this and it would divert attention. Um, and I think, I think there's a really important issue here about saying, oh, well, it would just be an add-on, an add-on done by who, um, put into place by who. Uh, so, so Gemma, please, it's, it's, it, it, it picks up some of what Sasha was saying about the, the need for legal protections and so on. So, uh, Gemma. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Gemma is up from Fragment here. Absolutely. You raised an interesting point. I mean, I think I just underscore what Maria said in that this would be an economic route as opposed to an asylum refugee route. So, the issue of non reformment does certainly bring it, uh, sort of raise its head, but one of the concessions that we would be looking for for is that I mean, anybody on a tier two general visa if they lose their job they can seek alternative employment with a tier two sponsor so there is an option to apply for what's called a change of employment but a concession that we would be looking for is um, exactly as you've indicated something to provide a little bit more security and um, a feeling of, sort of solidity in the UK to um, identify this particular demographic is, would really benefit from that. So we'd certainly look to build in a concession that, that would um, improve upon, upon the current situation. Um, so, you know, it, I mean, non reformer obviously falls specifically under refugee elements. I'm not sure if that is something specifically that we would consider, but we'd certainly be looking to build in uh, certain concessions within this visa route that would give added protection to these individuals, including also a shorter time frame on route to settlement. Um, typically it's five years for tier two general, but there are existing 
points-based system categories, which have a sort of slightly shorter route. So that's something that we'd be looking to mimic in this tier two displaced talent visa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joa. Um, uh, this is a slightly wider question for you, Sasha, but it's come in. So how is the UNHCR going to meet the tough international targets it's been set to resettle 3 million refugees by 2028? Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Richard, for this question. So uh, the, uh, the target is for both resettlement and complementary pathways. Um, also, it's a joint strategy that, that sort of put forward this uh, target. So it's not our strategy as UNHCR only, but it's UNHCR, states, NGOs and other actors involved. Um, so I think it's important to understand that complementary pathways are also included in that number. Um, and a big part of the strategy is growing safe alternative routes. Uh, so there is not an over-reliance on the very limited number of resettlement places as well. Thank you. Sorry, Richard, I should have called you in rather than asked the question on your behalf. Um, uh, Sab Sabrina uh, Muntazahazen, sorry if I've mispronounced your name, Sabrina, uh, would you like to come in and ask your question about the, the HE sector? Oh, uh, hi. Um, so my, just a, maybe a bit of background, I think that'd be useful because um, so I'm a re researcher, I'm, hi I'm a history researcher um, in anti-racism, um, in anti-racism and social justice pedagogies at UAL. Um, and my question is, to it's more so related to how can, um, in HE, how can you support students, um, refugee and migrant students, um, because I think that has come up quite a lot recently, uh, the issues within the sector. Um, and how do you think we should apply um, kind of more government based kind of pathways and thinking about new routes for um, migrant students and refugee students? Stephen, I think I'm going to come to you on migrant students. I'm not, I'm not sure that's an area I have sufficient expertise into it for right. this group. Okay, um, Sasha? Sorry, I, I, I'm... You're muted, Sasha. Sorry, I kind of uh, got distracted a bit. Do you mind repeating the question? <laughs> so within the UK HE sector, how do you suggest we apply these pathways for refugee and migrant students? Uh, I would say the education pathways is, is, is a whole different category and UNHCR is discussing this with various sectors, including universities, but also the, uh, uh, the government. We, we, have, we have initiated this discussion, but hopefully we'll carry it forward. Um, so if I may suggest we, uh, we can discuss this at another uh, okay. occasion. And I'm happy to receive any phone calls or emails directly um, after this and uh, maybe engage. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, Justin Brett. Has your question been answered or would you like to carry on, Justin? Which question? Um, uh, so I'm, uh, the one I've got in front of me is the one about uh, how can we ensure that the resettlement of refugees as part of the doesn't up, set up people in precarious situations? Yeah, and I think I've just followed that up with, with okay. another comment as well. Uh, so oh. I am Justin Brett. I work alongside Sheila at our transition CIC. Um, so I suppose it's a question of practicality around uh, once they've got the visa and, and they come over to the UK and they're in work, uh, let's say the job doesn't work out uh, and kind of what fail safes are in place to protect those people because they wouldn't have, as we've just heard, the, the kind of same protected status. Um, we're heading into a major recession, job losses uh, across the board in, in a lot of sectors. Um, with the visas that they would be on, uh, they wouldn't necessarily have the same access to the UK benefit system, but they would find themselves in, in housing and having bills to pay and families to support. Uh, and we know from our experience that, that getting people jobs uh, relevant to their careers is only half the battle. It might not even be half the battle. It's all the support that goes along with making sure that they stay in, in work. Um, so it's, it's, it's a comment on that. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Marina, do you want to comment? 
Yes, I do. And um, I will take my comments based on our experience of resettling over 100 people in, in Canada and Australia. So the first thing is that employers pay, play a really big role in the resettlement. So I'm going to read out some stats because we've just done a global evaluation, which I invite you all to have a look at on our website. Basically, 80% of candidates receive temporary accommodation between two weeks and two months. 80% received assistance with ongoing housing, where the um, lease was actually taken on by the employer to ensure that there are no issues with, with bonds and character checks. 70% of candidates were provided orientation services to their local area by the employers and the employer community. 60% of candidates were provided with cash allowances or transition allowances um, in terms of their international assignment. And then a wide range of other supports from purchasing groceries to free tax advice to um, English language support services and, and subsidised rent and electricity payments was, were actually taken on by employers. So the employer is the first entry into the community. What we envision then is a mobilising of the community. So as we saw in, um, or as, as we've heard from uh, Bishop Butler, there, there is a huge movement of community sponsorship. And again, we are not trying to conflate this solution with community sponsorship. But what we know is that civic society, once mobilised, is going to be the way in which integration is best achieved. So in the case of Haller, for example, um, he was um, integrated and, and supported by organisations like Cheltenham Welcomes Refugees and so on. So by having a displaced talent visa that says displaced talent, it allows these organisations to assist some of our candidates together with their employer and the community that they engage with their employer. In terms of this being temporary residence on a pathway to indefinite leave to remain, I'll pick up on Gemma's point and something that I know very well in Australia is that this is a temporary visa with a pathway to a durable solution, but with fail safes in that we back our candidates to be able to find another job, first of all. And second of all, we are looking at a reducing the time that it takes to get indefinite leave to remain be looking at options of waivers um, in terms of access to public funds, but also act, um, leave to remain on humanitarian grounds. So this is all part of the design because the end goal, of course, is durable solution and, and protection of these people. Um, and I, I would just say that literally this week we had a candidate who was made redundant as a mechanical water engineer in Australia from a project in Melbourne which was um, going through some troubles and, and he was made redundant. Within two weeks he found a job in Shepparton, a regional town in Victoria. This week he has moved and started a new job. So Ibrahim, he was actually, there was a photo of him on the slide. He's an example of where we back our candidates to be able to find another um, another employer because they've built a community around them. So we see this as a whole of society response, not as a government designated resettlement community sponsorship. And that's why we are here to build a network of all partners who can then take this on and play a role in, in the chain of displaced talent mobility. Thank you. Well, now that some more questions have come in, but we, we are running right up against our time now. And I wanted to see if Halef um, wanted to make any comment himself. Halef, you, you, you can say no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hello everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Halef Abed, first one of uh, who is coming via TBB. So thank you very much, TBB and UK government who accepted my uh, acquired to the visa. And also thank you, Iris, who is helping me to uh, get this visa. Um, to be honest, yeah, um, um, my life in Lebanon is, was very, very bad and all my skills was going to be died because uh, Lebanon not allowed uh, refugee to work as a uh, high level, just if you want to work as a, a cleaner. So my accommodation was uh, a cleaner, but um, to be honest, actually, I was working uh, illegal uh, as software engineer. Um, but uh, the government at the final said 
we cannot continue like this. We know many, many of people working as uh, engineers and doctors, but they, their accommodation is labeled as uh, as cleaners and some that low uh, work. So the government decide we will not allow these people to work again. Um, after that, really, uh, TBB helping me to find this solution, and it was a really, really good to get this visa. When, after I moved to the UK, um, all my life is totally changed. Now I'm working legally, and the, all the community really helping me. Many of organizations can help. Uh, also, my wife learning now English. He, she was uh, zero English, and now she knows many, many of words. So yeah, all our life are really, really changed. Hopefully, all the skills people or all the refugees who has skills can get this chance. That's what I want to say. Thank you, Halaf. Okay. Um, uh, so in, I'm sorry we haven't been able to deal with all the questions. That is always my experience at APPG events, that, that there's always more questions than there is time. Um, but uh, thank you to all those who've asked questions, whether we've had a chance to answer them or not. Um, you heard Sasha's offer to be contacted with any questions around particularly UNHCR stuff afterwards. So I'm volunteering Vinya uh, to, um, because obviously we have, a, we have a note of all the participants. Um, uh, uh, Stephen, your email is in the public realm anyway, isn't it? And TBB's is, Marina. Um, uh, so, um, if Vinya could just circulate around in case there are people who want to follow up on questions to, via email specifically, are you happy for that to happen? Marina, Stephen, Sasha. Yeah. We'll do that. Um, uh, clearly, this will be a, the, the, an ongoing discussion and debate. Uh, and we, we absolutely have to keep it set in the wider context uh, that Stephen gave us uh, because there are all sorts of ongoing questions that have to be uh, uh, looked at. Um, uh, just so people are aware, I'm uh, one of the reasons for running this particular thing during migration, uh, re during Refugee Week, is because um, we think that there is, with the, with the immigration bill currently going through the Commons and then coming to the Lords, an opportunity at least to raise this particular this this uh, as one of the questions through that that process and we will seek to be doing so um, we're very grateful that um, home office uh, officials have been sat listening so that they've they've been have heard uh, the the discussion the, the questions the debate because uh, we know there is an openness from them uh, to engage in the conversation uh, please be assured that myself and the others uh, of the RAMP project, which is a parliamentary project around migration, um, uh, are committed to it, to the wider issues, not just this one. Uh, and we're absolutely clear this has to be an additional complementary pathway. Um, so in concluding, my huge thanks to uh, Sasha and to Stephen and to Marina uh, for uh, speaking and uh, handling the questions. So clearly, thank you to uh, Gemma and the folk at Fragman for being willing to be around to answer the more technical ones as well. And again, my thanks to, to, uh, to Vinya and Laura and the RAMP team, who are the people, Josh works with me, uh, uh, and uh, Angela and Heather, for all the work that they've done behind the scenes to make sure that this APBG happened today, um, with which, uh, Bang on six o'clock. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Thanks farewell. Well.